Is it overclocked? I don't think so. Uh, Sorry. I lost so much respect for you. You meant to grab my four function? I'm about to do that. So yeah, that'd be a minute and a half TV. That one that's on the TV? Yes. It's so profound. <laughs> Is the audio live too? <laughs> Is it coming from that TV? No. Do we have a different monitor? I don't know. I don't know what they got. Yeah, there, that's where it's coming from. Greg, you don't get to tell me to do it over. Yeah. Ha. Huh. Oh, let's do it now. I, yeah. I guarantee it. Okay. okay. Thirty thousand feet and descending fast. Sorry guys, I can't tell which camera is actually good. That one. <laughs> um, so we're gonna build that, and then at the end, we're uh, gonna get it all together and blast it through my office speakers that we snagged a little bit ago, and uh, it's gonna be really cool. So, uh, but to start, let's have an explanation of the Rhea preamp, sirs. So we've got a turntable here that we borrowed from IT, and sort of in figuring this out, it turns out you can't just suck the groove off a record and listen to it directly. There's a lot more in between that goes on. That we'll get into the details of this a little bit later, but they use a pre-emphasis, de-emphasis curve to make it mainly so you can fit the maximum amount of music on the disc with the least amount of noise. Could I ask a silly question? Yeah. So with regard to um, pre-emphasis and de-emphasis uh, and a lot going on, right? Before there were electric turntables, you had like, you know, you the, the like, needle and the horn. Yeah, you had Obviously the, the wax cylinder. Yeah, so. there, there was no, there wasn't anything electronic in that. The, the, the groove cut in the wax cylinder was exactly you know, the mechanical vibration that went down the thing to, to vibrate the needle to record it. Okay. And then was reproduced on playback. Okay, so what was the purpose of introducing that? Just the response of the recording procedure? Um, mainly the, the, the size of the groove dictates how much music you can squeeze onto something. Okay. That I think an Edison cylinder was maybe two minutes of music. There wasn't a lot there. And part of it is just that the size of the groove is so large. Okay. That if, if you want to cram them real close together but not have them overlap, then it, it has to be big. Okay, I get it. Okay, sorry. And so the, the preamp <laughs> compensates for that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Of course. Keep on keeping on. Or is that all of it? Um, or do we, you, the question you asked right before we went live was what is Rio? Why do we call it that? That before, in the, I think it was the 50s, the Rio standardized how you play back a, a, an LP. 
that every record company had their own proprietary standard, and they didn't all match and agree. And then they did. Yes, so they, they standardized it, and then everybody's discs were playable on everybody's players. And then they started suing people. OK, cool. So um, I'm going to check my notes here to make sure I tell you everything I need to. So uh, I'm going to be building uh, the STA540 power amp. And the whole idea behind a power amp is that it drives power into a low impedance load. Uh, we're still on this one, right? Guys, yes? The, 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 all, I, all I see here is like the desk. So I don't know what's on that. It's on that one. OK, cool, thank you. Um, and so uh, a speaker is a low impedance load, right? Uh, but it's not, it, it's a very frequency dependent load, right? It, uh, uh, the, the power amp is designed to give a very flat response out. Uh, a speaker, if you look at its impedance over frequency, is more like, and it's really wacky. Uh, and so what this thing is supposed to do is drive evenly through all of those frequencies and sort of, uh, um, and sort of balance it all out. So that's that's the point of this. Um, now, a couple of things about this kit: uh, the power input is not regulated. And the point behind that is so that you can actually uh, you can you can give it like a couple of different uh, voltage sources to to uh, to power it. <laughs> I'm just repeating myself. Uh, and the point behind that is that if you give it a higher voltage in, you get a higher volume out. So it, it varies, right? Um, let me just check my notes here real quick. Um, you can actually, uh, the STA540, which is the, the, the primary part of this thing, the kit, the, the heart of the kit, this guy, right? Um, it, it actually has a max voltage in of about 24 volts. Uh, and that's absolute max. That's like, don't run it higher than that. Uh, normally, I run it at about 12. Right, so you, there's a lot of 12-volt uh, power supplies around that'll drive this thing. Um, 12 volts beyond that, it's got a standby switch, so it won't make a loud pop when you turn it on and off. That's kind of cool. It's got a peak indicator on it, so you can tell when you're driving it too hard or it's you know railing. Um, and uh, it's got separate left and right controls, so you can kind of balance it out in your workspace a little easier. And uh, yeah. I think that's, uh, that's the big description about that. Uh, once upon a time, I designed this kit, so if you hate this kit, you can hate on me. It's cool. I'm good. Uh, and then, all right, I'm going to build this. I'm going to turn this over to you guys. OK. So I think just to, to start the discussion, we should talk about what a preamplifier is. OK. The, the or I wanted to ask the question, okay. what would happen if you took a, the record player and plugged it directly into the amplifier? Mm. It wouldn't sound very good. Well, it wouldn't sound like anything, would it? Probably not. There's there's almost no voltage coming off coming off the cartridge itself. Okay, so should we talk about what's in the microphone or what's in the, well, the record player itself? Let's step step back one little little step and talk about just the general concept of preamps. Okay. That a, a preamp is an amplifier for conditioning where Pete's building a power amp here intended to put a lot of voltage into a low impedance source. A preamp is more of an interfacing device to, to bridge from one thing to another, not necessarily a lot of power, but to give it the peculiarities of the interface that um, preamps turn up in a lot of different application, applications, not just hooking up to a turntable. If you interface with a microphone, there's a particular preamp for that. If you work with a thermocouple or a load cell, there are preamps for that. So once we got the preamp built, we'll be able to plug it into any kind of a line-in device and That's be right. able to hear what's coming off the record. Exactly. That we we will we will take the sort of peculiarities of the output of the turntable and make them something that we can interface with more easily. And in, in this case, we can plug it right into Pete's power amp and hopefully hear actual music. <laughs> if I don't jack this up, <laughs> which is and, and, and given a non-zero probability. Yeah, just, just one more thing worth mentioning here. Since we are on YouTube, we can't use other people's music. Uh, yeah. So we've, we've got some, some non-copyrighted music that we can play. Some public domain. Music such as it is. Signals <laughs> that we can play. <laughs> Test sounds, anyway. Yeah, so 
getting into this, when I proposed this idea a couple months ago, I knew that there was a RIA preamp. I didn't know the exact specifics. I knew it was a thing. I don't have a turntable at home. I'd never really looked too closely. And so we did a bunch of research. Um, we, we backed off to the old, what is this, the National Semiconductor Audio Radio Handbook that has a whole chapter on turntable preamps. And it had a pretty good history of what they are and why we need them. Should we share the paper of the record? We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> but yeah, we should, we should probably talk Don't about... Ahead, man. <laughs> Talk about records. So a, a record these days is a you know, circular piece of vinyl that the music is represented by a groove that has been cut into it, a little you know, mountain landscape that has been dug into the surface of the thing with a, a little cutting bit. In fact, they, I think they called it a chisel in here. And as Pete was saying, like a wax cylinder, the, the groove exactly represented the audio that had been applied. There was a diaphragm that moved a needle to make the cut. And then the opposite works as well. When you're playing it back, that needle moves the diaphragm the same amount that the recording exactly. was. Exactly, exactly. Which is why you have that, that great big bell-shaped horn, is that you have a mechanical amplifier in both directions there. Okay, so by the nature of its shape, it takes care of all of its frequencies and uh, ranges on its own. It's going to come out the same as it went in because it's the same That's right, tube. It's, it's one to one. And if you've ever heard a wax cylinder, they're kind of scratchy, kind of lo-fi sounding. Yeah, like the old telephones. Like yeah. The old telephones. Yeah, yeah, yeah the old... <laughs> Maybe not that old. <laughs> <laughs> Here. Well, uh, Atos is wondering, what's wrong with Mozart? Why can't you play that on YouTube? Is Mozart public domain? Yeah. The, hey, no idea. The music probably is public domain, but the sound recording is a separate copyright. Uh, yep. Yep, yep, yep. And that we, we would have to license we would have to license the recording unless we went and did the due diligence to find a recording of Mozart that was out of copyright. And that's a bigger exercise than we wanted to take on for this show. <laughs> okay. Next question. So, any more questions? Okay, so, so as we were saying, but the wax cylinder was pretty lo-fi. Um, they decided somewhere, I guess in the 30s, that there were some things that they could do about the fidelity that a lot of the noise, the, the high frequency, grainy, scratchy kind of sound, is due to the properties of the material. The wax cylinder, they were using shellac at one time, or nowadays they use vinyl, all of which have, you know, the, the material itself is a little bit gritty. Yeah, it would and chip when you tried to cut it, and that would sound like high frequencies. That's right, and it, it's just like a, a hissy, staticky, high frequency emphasized noise. So to, to undo that, what they do is they boost the high frequencies when they make it. So you get extra high frequency printed into the groove. When, when you play it back, you turn it back down, and that the noise of the groove is relatively reduced as you restore it. The other thing that goes on, as I sort of hinted at in the wax cylinder example, is that the size of the groove you know, if your grooves are too big, they will hit each other, and then the needle can't track if the grooves overlap. Right. So you said you, you, you can't you tell store one pass from the next. Uh, if you turn down the base so that the uh, deflection on the needle is very small, then you can fit more wraps of the track around precisely, the record. Precisely. And then again, just like with the high frequencies, you can re-emphasize the base on playback. And that if, if you you know if you put this curve in on the input side and this curve on the output side, eventually it should come back out flat. Okay, so the RIAA -I -I -A has created this frequency response that this preamp has to match in order for us to hear the record as it was intended to be. That's right. Correct. Okay. And that you had some some notes about what the, the frequency response of that preamp should look like. Sure. Uh, well, do we want to start there? Um, 
Where do you want to take apart the... Oh, there it is. Why don't we take apart the cartridge, Let's since that's where the this whole starts. Wait. Okay. <laughs> um, can we steal the close-up camera? Okay. Whoa. You know, for what it's worth, I can't read any of the bands on these resistors. You need an extra. What's wrong with that guy? Can he see? No, I can't. <laughs> I know how to read a color code. I just can't see the color code. All right. Are we in on the close shot here? So this is a cartridge from a, a DJ-style turntable. Um, and I, I've disassembled it before, but I, I'll do it again. Normally what happens is that there's another piece that fits onto the, uh, the bottom of it that has the actual needle, which is a, uh, a piece of diamond or gem or hard mineral. Um, and then it interfaces in here and wiggles around and causes this to create small signals that then can be picked up. Um, and maybe we should talk about the difference between mono and stereo here, because that, this, this yes, will make that will. pretty obvious that a, an old wax cylinder or an old mono record, it's basically the depth of the cut vertically into the surface. Can I draw a picture? Go for it. Or am I going to be up, right side up or upside down? I'm going to be upside down. Okay. <laughs> ah, you punk! Don't Sorry. The table. <laughs> so okay, I'm so going to just draw it upside down. recording only has one signal at a time. So we've got some kind of a trough, uh, and as that move this in, there we closer. go. That that trough will get shallower and deeper um, to emulate the signal. So so if you're looking at a cross section of the record here, uh, it'll go shallow and then it'll go deep. And then it'll get picked up as a some kind of a sinusoid as it goes. And, and it's worth mentioning that this is very much an analog process. That the the sound pressure in the air is exactly what's represented by the depth of the groove there. Right. So if you hear the frequency, that's the same rate at which those those peaks and troughs go by the needle. Um, now for stereo, how did they do it? For stereo, they, they flip it 45 degrees and add a second axis. So the trough looks about the same, but what they're picking up, what they're cutting into it and what they're picking up is different. That you've got you know, a left and a right. So you have two signals superimposed in this. one groove. Is that gonna be right? Is that an L? Maybe. I think I think I got it. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, as the, the left channel goes along this axis, it picks up on, on one side of the, the stereo, and as the right, it goes the other way. Um, and we can see that pretty obviously in your cartridge there. That the, the needle itself is this 45 degree diamond with a hook sort of on the end that is the stylus tip. Right, the the cartridge has a sort of a slot in it that that interfaces. Do you have a flashlight or a flashlight on your phone? Yeah. How's your build? Is that better? <laughs> uh, Here, hold it. Well, I have ascertained uh, the 1K resistors. They're bigger, so I can read the colors on those. So that's kind of cool, but you know, you, but anyway, we, can we, can see, we can't see anyway. through it really. Are we uh, on the middle cam? Uh, yes, we're on the. Uh, okay, so this is how the thing would sit on good. the record, kind of down like that. And if you look really carefully into the end, very hard to see. Um, there are these metal pieces. Oops, I'm gonna show it in the thing. There they are. Uh, the metal pieces here are forming two magnetic circuits that go at, at the 45 degrees, like that and that. Um, and then they wrap around the outside and switch sides so that they interlock, uh, and then come out on the inside. Now the metal, the, the needle part that goes in there has a magnet in it that wiggles around in that space between these two magnetic circuits. Uh, and then somewhere inside this molding there's a bunch of coils wrapped around that, that iron. Um, and then those coils pick it up and pipe it out to the output pins. And it's, it's worth mentioning that this is a moving magnet pickup. Right. That, that there are also ceramic pickups that use the piezoelectric effect and moving coil pickups that sort of reverse the, the situation 
of this pickup, that the coil moves, the magnet is stationary. So are we going to build a stereo or a mono today? We're going to build a stereo mainly because we've got dual op amps. So in doing, doing the background research for, for the SparkFun Live, in the good old National Semiconductor Audio Radio Handbook, they have a pretty detailed derivation of a RIA preamp. Um, pages and pages of equations here to be solved to figure out what to do. And in the end, they, they turn up with um, component values that are pretty hard to find. And in doing a little further research, I found a simplified schematic with component values already recommended. This is, it was National Semiconductor, now it's Texas Instruments, and this is AppNote 346. Um, and can we talk about the GitHub? Yes. Okay, Go um, we've got uh, a link to a GitHub, and it's below, and... Are you sure? What was that? Are you sure? I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it is. So if you go into the GitHub, uh, we've got that application note there uh, that you can download. We also have a schematic in a JPEG that, that is the actual schematic that we're going to be building. Um, so yeah, if you want to pull up, pull up the data sheet or the schematic, we are building the non-inverting form of this. Um, we've got a few extra components on our... Yeah, we've, um, we've added a few pieces to it. If you pull up the SPICE schematic... Oh, uh, that's good. For those who don't know, what's a SPICE schematic? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a program uh, called LT SPICE, formerly uh, P SPICE. Switcher SPICE. Uh, the, Switcher the company Spice. Linear Technology made their own version of it and put all their components in it so you can just plop them in and use them. Yeah. Um, SPICE itself is a circuit simulation language. Um, traditionally, it was very much a text-based language that you'd write like a text description, you know, horrible piece of hard to decipher. You would specify all the nodes that are connected, and then it would interpret the, that, that text file of all the connected nodes and give you all the voltages across the elements. And, and the output would also be a text file of just a list of voltages over time or <laughs> voltage, voltage over frequency. That LT Spice adds a graphic front end on it, that we can draw a schematic, we can wire it together, then you can run it, and so rather than soldering everything up together first and then finding out it doesn't work, you can just see that your simulation failed. Which is how I do it. Oh, I did look over there. <laughs> 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 um, especially with this frequency stuff, if, if you get your math wrong, you might not know until you put it all together and are very confused as to why it's not working. Um, so with this SPICE model, uh, we were able to simulate what the frequency response would be and try to match it to the RII, RIAA standard. Um, so uh, between the old, the, the actual application note, they just give us the core, um, which does the frequency response, and then we've added some extra components on it to make it work physically uh, with our inputs and outputs. But I think we'll talk about that later. You want to talk about the frequencies? Yeah. Like the yeah, well, yeah let's, let's talk about the the Raya curve. Okay. But, is there a good picture of it? Maybe that little teeny one. Yeah, back to app note 346. This is what the frequency response of this circuit looks like. I don't know if you can see it. It starts at 20 hertz and ends at 20 kilohertz, so the audio range. And across that range, it's effectively just a dropping slope that at 20 hertz, it's 20 dB above the reference level, and at 20 kilohertz, it's 20 dB below the reference level. All right, so if you, if you take, and you, you look at this, it's kind of a, it's not a straight line, it's kind of a funny wiggle that they've decided was a good enough approximation of, of what they wanted, um, and it was actually buildable. Should I talk about poles? Yes, I think it's should. time. I don't yes, know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's happening. We, we can't avoid it any longer. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I can. I, I might turn this camera around if that's all right. Ooh. 
as the viewers get seasick. Maybe it wasn't online. Thank you. So the problem, I'm gonna say the most common filter, I don't, I'm not sure, um, is the RC filter. Uh, and what it means, you have a, a resistor and a capacitor uh, in, in series. Oops, let's try that again. There we go. And we have an input voltage and an output voltage. And when you build an RC uh, filter, what you get is a, what's called a low-pass low filter. Um, and this means it passes all the frequencies below some point. And that point it, uh, is dependent on the values of the resistor and the capacitor. Um, I don't think I want to derivate them, but this is, so this is a, the most basic filter. And if you would look at it on a, a log scale, uh, if, we, if we had our knee, uh, let's say 100 hertz, um, and then we graphed it where we have low frequencies on the left and high frequencies on the right, what's going to happen is as the frequency increases, that knee is the, the 3 dB point, or the point where the attenuation is negative 3 dB from unity. Um, and then it will curve down and slope downward at a rate of 20 decibels per octave. That one? Does it look good? <laughs> All right. Um, so, if you wanted to make a very simple preamp, you could just move that knee down to the 20 hertz beginning and say, well, that's straight enough. Um, but if we compare it to our other shape, it's, it's much, much steeper as specified. Uh, so you put a couple of poles in there to push it down, down farther. Um, I don't know how to explain this. Well, the, uh. <laughs> in the middle of the sort of S-shaped curve there, there's actually what's specified as a flat point. Right here. Above, All right. above which it drops and below which it's boosted. So, uh, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about this. This is what would be called a pole, right? It's not zero. Pull, pulls pulls go down. <laughs> yes. OK. <laughs> you can have the opposite effect in a, 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 a filter where you have some knee and it's a zero instead of a pole at which it starts gaining above it instead. And this is not going to be the low pass. This is an abstract concept now. So if we had a pole or a zero here, uh, unity ga gain comes in. And as you approach that, you start climbing at a rate of 20 dB per octave. 20 dB per decade. Decade. Thank you. 6 dB per octave. All right, so now the RIAA, hey, I got that right that time, has a set of frequencies that they've determined are where the knees should be to make this special frequency response curve. And I have written them down. All right, so 50 hertz, 500 hertz, and 2 kilohertz, or 2112 hertz. Um, I'll mark them out. An auspicious number for all your prog rock fans. Wait, what did you say? No, I don't get 2112? I should know this, shouldn't I? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> you're, you're being tested. Ah! On which prog rock album? I can't remember. 2112. By Rush. Oh, see, that's. All right, we're, I'm not. No, I'm not going there. Never mind. <laughs> All right, so I know where these locations and the frequencies of, of the knees are. Um, and I'm just going to start drawing, coming in from the low frequency with the unity gain. We come to our, our first, first pole at 50 hertz, and we're going to start going down at a rate of 20 per decade until we get to something new, uh, which is about 500, well, exactly 500, where we have a zero. And so the zero goes up. 20 dB, but we're already going down 20 dB, so really it, it levels off until we get up to 2K. And that 2K, start going down again. And so this is a shape that pretty much matches the kind of crazy wiggly shape that uh, has been specified. 
Um, and so now all we have to do is figure out some way of configuring an op amp such that it has that characteristic. And that's where the app note comes in and they've solved it all out for us already. That's yep. what I got. Yep. So Pete, how is your build coming? Um, probably a little slower than I expected. Um, having more difficulty reading things off of components than I thought I was going to. Turns Likewise. out I've gotten a little older than I used to be, and maybe the prescription isn't what it used to be. Uh, but I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, I have so far uh, only very briefly looked at the instructions, you know, because I'm too damn smart to look at instructions. Hey, you. You quiet down over there. Uh, but we're going. We're going. Uh, a little bit of bad soldering, but I think we're going to have something that burns, if nothing else. <laughs> Did we start? And so maybe we should talk about one more piece of all this. Want to look at it? Yeah. Back, back to our schematic. The, one of the things that complicates our schematic a little bit is that we're using a single-ended supply. Hmm. That uh, we're using an LM358 op amp. It's a, it's a dual, and it's specified as a single-ended supply op amp. You, you're supposed to ground the negative power pin, and the other one can be fed with anything up to about 36 volts. So if, if Pete can be powered, what was it, 24? Max? Absolute max. Abs max of 24. So if, if you've got your 24 or 18 or 12 or whatever, whatever we're feeding it, we can, we can piggyback on that same supply pretty easily if, if we do a single-ended design. But the single-ended design has a couple of tricks. So the, the signal coming off the coil that's represented by this voltage source is swinging about ground. Or is actually one end swinging about the other of the coil. What is it about 500? It was specified 500 millivolts. No, it's like 200 millivolts. 10 millivolts. Okay, so it goes positive 10, 10 millivolts, then negative 10 millivolts. So we we can't yeah. go below negative. We can't go below negative, but we can um, AC couple the signal through the amplifier. That we can add a DC offset to it. So that rather than, for example, rather than being plus minus 10 millivolts, if we were on a 12 volt rail, we could be at 6.01 and 5.099, or excuse me, 5.98. All right. So how do we how do we make this AC coupled into the center of the rail? And we're using an equal value voltage divider here to de to derive a reference voltage for the input of the op amp. The, the coil input is actually this voltage source. I misspoke a moment ago. We're coupling it into the system through a large capacitor. The, from the perspective of the coil, that capacitor isn't there. But from the perspective of the, of the DC offset that we generate here, it doesn't flow backwards into the coil. If you want to draw some current many, arrows. Oh, you want, uh, I was going to draw something else. You want to draw oh, something? No, help yourself. I was going to say, uh, if this, so this is our VN signal, and if that's uh, zero, it goes like that. Um, this is our post-coupled signal, and if that's zero, then the post-coupled signal is highly, it's offset, and that's the point. Yes. yes. Um, and the current will kind of go both ways back into the needle. The DC current won't. Right, right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that was the aside that I wanted to mention before we get into building this. And then, so, well, we should also mention on the output, we don't want to be driving a, a six volts at whatever we've plugged it into. Um, we want that to be centered about zero again. Yes. So we do the same trick on the we, output. We want to restore the the ground referenced AC signal. Um, We're talking about selecting the valley part. We should probably get to building. We should probably. I think get we had, to we're building. at like 35, 40 minutes already. We're, we're 33 in, so we'd better get <laughs> get jumping. Okay. So we have a design, we've simulated it, and we like how it comes out in the LT sim. And then I took the time to draw out manually how this will fit on a solderable protoboard. 
that I didn't take the time to do it in fritzing. I was just working with, with a pencil and paper. But I've, I've got a pretty good idea of where I want to put my components. And while Marshall was speaking, I sorted out my array of components here. Um, we've got various resistors um, in the values that were specified by the data sheet. We've got some um, one microfarad electrolytic caps. We've got some, what are these, 4.7 nanofarad film caps. And a, oh boy, what is this? <laughs> find it on the schematic, a 15 nan nanofarad film cap as well. Um, a couple of RCA jacks. The, the turntable that we'll be using actually has a hardwired RCA um, pigtail output on it, so these are the right thing to use. And as I mentioned before, we've got the um, LM358 dual op amp. So I should probably dig into building. Okay, I'm thinking I'm gonna uh, start making wires and attaching, I'm that not sure how you'd like to put these on here. If you could put like a little sort of pigtail harness, on those. put a red wire on one and a white wire on the other and green for ground. <laughs> uh, stranded, soldered, or solid? <laughs> Whichever's I easier. I can't yeah, read these things, man. <laughs> I'll be right back. Uh-oh, everyone's leaving you. No, 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 I'm going right back. Pete chickened out. Let's see. I think I figured out where my soldering iron went. I already stole it. All right, you've got some, some cutters. Yes, the, the lovely chaos of live TV when everything has disappeared off your desk. <laughs> That's not work. Red and white. Um, yeah, red and red and white for the signals, and green for ground. So I think it's red is right. That that's correct. This is a, a standard color code. If, you, if you've looked at the back of <laughs> was that a burn? That sounded like yes. No, that was not a no, oh, I, I yeah, couldn't this, remember. This is, this is the honest truth. The red is right, and the other color is left. If you take apart a pair of like earbud headphones, red is there will oh, yeah, yeah, be two yeah, pieces of magnet yeah, wire yeah, running okay, up the okay. thing. One, usually one with like a green or a blue lacquer, and one with a red lacquer. The red, red will be right. right. I have no idea where that standard came from. It might just be that the mnemonic of red and right is easy to remember. What do we say when we work? Well, yeah, what do we say when we're working? Are there any questions? Yeah, how's our audience faring? Do we have any audience? Uh, I think they, they can ask questions to the side. Um, yeah, well, if you've got, got any questions about anything, uh, drop us a line. <laughs> this desk has been passed around a bit in Idaho. And then I hauled it out here. <laughs> but there's not a lot of space in Boulder, so I can't fit it in my new apartment. Decided to be a great workbench here at work. I'm a little jealous of this, this table. It's pretty sweet. And that other one's kind of junky, so I can't wait to put that back downstairs. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, dude, I'm sorry. Do you want it? No. No. Oh. I'm just sorry. <laughs> oh, no, the desk is good. It's the, the, the old... I have to be concerned. I'm the boss. The old oh, really? EDR. Oh. I'm so sensitive. So, well, I'm, thank, I'm glad, glad you're concerned. I'm like, very concerned. How's it going over here? Uh, I'm trying to anticipate how many things I may have made mistakes on. <laughs> Kids, for anybody watching at home, always test... Your, your, your V plus and ground to make sure it's not shorted before you plug it in for the first time. You can bet that I'll be doing that today. Shut up! 
Also, I think I'm, I lost an LED because I opened this kit like a child on Christmas. Like, ah, 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 and all the parts went everywhere. So, I'm short of one LED. Oops. I can grab you another one. Ah, that'll do. Thank you, sir. favorite colors are. <laughs> is that Brennan? No. <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> he is watching though. <laughs> uh, I guess mine goes between blue and green, depending on my mood. I'm a fan of purple. Purple? No? They asked your favorite color, not what does your mood ring say. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you so mean to me, Greg? <laughs> It varies. Okay. Punk. Byron. I don't know. Green? Gray? Orange? <laughs> I don't like yellow. How's that? Oh. I have like a least favorite color rather than a favorite color. Yellow well, I steal your favorite. yellow wires. You don't like them. <laughs> Notice none of you mentioned Spark Fun Red on there. Why would you say that? <laughs> I would have called it red. Uh, I would have called it red. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what camera's active. My son likes red. He's big into it. Byron, do you know how these are wired? Are these outside two, uh, but one is a detector? Yeah, yeah, one is so sweat. So let's plug something into it. Okay. There you go. So we do have another question from the audience. Tom says, I have a portable speaker which takes a cable with mini USB on the speaker side and audio jack on the input side. How do I solder my own cable from the audio jack to the mini USB? <laughs> Oh boy. Byron, you're up. <laughs> hey, did I, did I hear that right? He wants to pass audio through the USB and he's trying to patch? That's not, I didn't hear that. Yeah, can you repeat the question? I have a portable speaker which takes on, which takes a cable with mini USB on the speaker side and an audio jack on the input side. How do I solder my own cable from the audio jack to mini USB? Oh. Okay, so it's, it's, it's one cable, and on one side it's got the USB, and on the other end of the, the single cable is the audio. Is that, am I correct? I think, I'm wondering if it has a, a sound card inside uh, of yeah, it. I'm, I'm wondering if there's a, a chip hidden in one of the overmolds on one end of the cable. Or he's just got the portable speaker that just has an audio in. He's going to send a photo. OK, cool. <laughs> I like it. Seems like there's information missing. Pete, there is a question about your audio kit. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. What is it? Why does the kit have separate volume knobs? Um, let me try to think back to why I made that decision. Part of it might be um, I was doing uh, I was doing a tube amp design at the time, back in, back in the day, and uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, a dual uh, audio pod, right, one shaft, two pots in an audio taper, uh, was expensive and I didn't want to pay for it because I'm like that, I'm cheap. Um, and I discovered that uh, actually having it that way was kind of cool, I dug it, it was all right. And so when I did this one, um, it was the same thing. I, I could either spend hours and hours and hours trying to source a pot that was, uh, that was you know, dual pot audio taper, um, and I knew it was going to be expensive, or I could just throw down two and call it good. So that's what I did. It was cheaper that way, um, and I just got to like to be able to do it separately. So that's it. I mean, it, it amounts to a balance control, nothing else. So that's why I did it. Well, if this is the DIY community. If if I need a matched, balanced, paired pot, I, I understand the circuit well enough that I can throw one in. Yes, you could. Because that's just a divider on the input, right? 
Um, I can't remember where I put the pot. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, yes. According to the traces that I see here on the board, yes, that is a divider on the input. So pretty easy to replace with something with a yeah. little pot outboard yeah. now to do a panel or something. You might have to hot glue it down. Yeah, now uh, to do a panel. You can do that too. I prefer hot glue. What have I forgotten? Something. Everybody here working frantically to <laughs> make things work. I figured out which side <laughs> it is. Your supply has limiting, right? Current limiting? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah, we can just turn that it. down and see what happens. That's smart. So I figured out these uh, these little audio jacks, the RCA types. They have three pins on the bottom, but I know that the RCA only has two. Um, so I just figured out one of them is the actual connection, and the other one must be some kind of a switch or a disconnect. Yeah, it's an interrupt, um, right? So that there's a th the three different poles on it, but it's only got two. So I use my multimeter over here to figure out what's connected to what um, after plugging in a test a test barrel that I had. And I've seen that like that on a quarter inch. Uh, audio jacks as well. You can, it detects when you plug something in. I'll borrow this for a sec? Sure. Who's gonna do it? Talk to myself. Dead air, guys. Somebody ask an interesting question. Oh, oh, let me come and look at that. what these what's your favorite spark plug kit Pete? this one <laughs> the uh, question was what Pete's favorite kit was oh that was the actual question I thought you were just throwing that at me just to be Greg. Um, that's a good um, yeah, the Simons are pretty cool uh, I've given them to my kids they dig them um, the amplifier, uh, not to toot my own horn, uh, but I, I have several of these at home. I run one in my garage, I run one in my basement. Um, so as far as usefulness goes, this is probably the most useful for me. I'll say that the, what is it, the binary blaster? Really? That thing's pretty cool. Yeah. That's another well, one. My when, kids I, when I was like. in school, I wished I'd had something like that to quiz me on on hexadecimal. That's Pete Lewis's board. Kudos to Pete. So going back to your uh, volume knobs, uh, Har, I apologize if I'm butchering names, has seen a lot of dual knob designs on the net and in books, and almost none with the volume balance instead of left to right. Is there a reason you went that way? Uh, you know, I can't remember. Can't remember, man. It was a lot of years ago. How long ago did you design that kit, Pete? Oh, jeez. It was like... <laughs> um, seven, eight years ago? Six years ago? I don't know, man. The day's blur. It was, over, it was over five. It was oh, certainly over five. Um, I don't know. Basically, uh, when when I became the director of the department and we started taking on more people, uh, I did less and less design, and I do none now, which is unfortunate because it's my favorite thing to do, pretty much. Um, although I'd say I don't like I don't get off on the board layout as much as other people do. Um, I would just as soon have a pile of parts and the circuit board, and I'll just, I'll work from a schematic. Um, I was a tech for a lot of years before I became an engineer, and I just got really comfortable doing that. Um, I miss surface mount prototyping. Man, I wish more people did that. 
sorry, I'm rambling now. Sorry. That's cool. I, I can ramble. I took a look at look at the picture of the cable, um, and it's super confusing to me. <laughs> So on one end, it's got a regular USB and an audio jack. And on the other end, it has two mini USBs. What's that supposed to do? I, I don't know how it would, would, I think it might be, uh, uh, it, well definitely it's not a standard USB cable. Um, but it's probably, some, uh, sometimes you can get products that are like all in one. And I've seen, Similar cables like that, where they've just used, they're just using the connectors and connecting things in various ways. Um, how to get it going? If you wanted to use it without the, the cable, I would look for a data sheet or uh, documentation. Actually, honestly, I would take it apart because <laughs> that's what I do, um, and I would look that's, inside and see how it's life. connected together. <laughs> but I can't I can't answer straight up what. Uh, what yeah, would be used to replace it. And that's actually sort of one of the classic problems in audio is people perhaps repurposing existing connectors for other things. Like, you know, a professional microphone will use a three pin XLR. But I have seen high voltage power supplies that use exactly that same connector. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you certainly wouldn't want in you know in the heat of the moment doing something, producing a live show perhaps to confuse them and plug the wrong one in. So another question, uh, when is the next According to Pete video? Uh. And also, for those who don't know, what is According to Pete? Uh. <laughs> uh, according to Pete is a video that um, I do where I uh, butcher basic electronic subjects for the masses for comedy. Is that one? Sorry. Um, and uh, people seem to dig it from time to time, so that's kind of fun. Uh, when will I be doing the next one? Um, Greg and I have been talking. I've been doing uh, another presentation preparation for uh, uh, on the side, and I haven't had time to really jump into it. But I might do like a uh, PID thing. There's a couple other ideas floating around. I just need a little bit of time after hours to work on a project. Um, I really like to, to have a really good knowledge of the subject before I jump in and I try to explain it. Because otherwise I sound like an idiot. And although you may think I'm very accustomed to sounding like an idiot, which I am, I try not to. So I need to work on a project for a while before I can do it. Um, but uh, there's, there's definitely something in the works. Uh, yeah, there. Good? Good. A few weeks. A few, let's say a few weeks, yes. Byron, there's a question for you. Are okay. there any more spark punk items in the works? Ooh, um, good question. Not at the moment. But there, there is a, a certain project that if you're interested in the spark punk, you'll probably be interested in, but that's about all I want to commit to here, here on live TV. <laughs> it's a good product, too. Um, I guess sort of also on that vein, I'm doing a revision of our MIDI shield. And we've been working on a whole bunch of projects and documentation for that. That should hopefully breathe some new life into it. I jacked something up. You too? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've I knew I would. I mean, I'm, I'm just, but uh, let's see if I can yank this out without destroying anything, uh -huh. or burning myself. Burning myself is good. So you want to make me another little, little thing from a power harness, just like a twist of to. black and red. Uh, what are we going to be plugging in? Power supply? Yeah. All you've been in. That would be wonderful. Uh, so what parts? <laughs> Resistors? No oh, okay. caps? You want to take a look at your board? Um, what are we doing? Okay. Explain what you're doing. The, yeah, the, the closer we look at it, the more I'll screw it up. So. Okay. 
We'll take a quick peek then. Oh, that feels. So th this is where I am. I've got the op amp solder down. I've got little jumpers to the power rails. And then I've got 47K resistors that if you look at the schematic are the loading resistor on the coil input. And next I was going to go do the next step in the chain, put some one mic caps, which are the coupling caps to the op amp input. Sure, I'll, I'll talk about it. And I should be putting the negative side of these polarized caps to the pull-down resistor because the inside will be biased up. Right, so he's talking about here's the load resistor, which is kind of reported by RIAA, you said? Um, the, the, the cartridges are designed to have a 47K load on them. Otherwise, they'd be all distorted, I suppose. Uh, here's the coupling cap that he's putting in right now. Uh, I've got two of these worked up together, uh, one for right and one for left. And now I'm working on some power tails to power the whole thing up, plug it into the power supply. We'll make, make Pete nervous over here for a minute. Ah! What's that? Oh. And he's just going way at it. Yeah, I averted my crisis. Oh, this one anyway. Alright. So I'll just leave that there. What do you want? He's trying to make you nervous. I'm not gonna stop you. You're not making me nervous. Okay. Didn't jack that That's nice. We're talking about testing, are we? That was kind of a nervous look. <laughs> Oh, you didn't, you didn't just see the... Uh, hello. Hi, I'm my circuit board. Uh, what I did, um, I had this, uh, I think it's a 0.47 microfarad cap. I put it in the peak LED hole, <laughs> like an idiot, because I am an idiot. Can't help it, sorry. Um, so I yanked it out and I cleaned the holes out so I could put the LED in there and then I reinserted it in the proper position and that's really all. So not much for troubleshooting, but but much for fixing. Now I gotta figure out what polarity that LED goes in because I cannot tell from the board itself. You grab you a schematic too if you need it. I don't need those well, stinking schematic. Ah, uh, what's the worst that could happen? You know what? It's not going to peak anyway because it's going to be so clean. I don't even need this LED. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, okay. Note to self. When we revise this kit, put some damn indications down <laughs> to show which way the LEDs go. Do, 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 do. Long twisted. I don't, I don't know. However, LED is located at the word peak and is just to the right. Have any of you built any other audio projects like this? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I worked for a company that made professional grade synthesizers at the start of my career. So a lot of audio um, on and off my workbench. Um, I've built equalizers, microphone preamps. Never built a turntable preamp before, which is why this is kind of kind of a, fu a fun seat of the pants project here. I agree. I made a lot of. Uh, I usually mixers are pretty common. Um, they're expensive if you buy them from a music store, but if you can wire them together with an op amp, um, you get them for very cheap. But I haven't made a, a, a record input either. Actually, I learned a lot about this uh, <laughs> while talking to you about it. I didn't even know that it had the curve. I thought it was flat. Well, and if, if you've ever tried to you know, take an old receiver and plug a turntable into the wrong input, you learn pretty quickly that there's some magic on the Fano input. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or if you plug your line into the Fano, then it, it, it's overdriven and distorted. Um, that's when I learned about and, it. And yeah, like there's 40 dB of gain there that you weren't, weren't mm -hmm. expecting. <laughs> It's also similar on a, like a sound blaster or audio card or something. You're going to have that line in, you're going to have a mic in. Um, one of them is going to have a preamp and the other one is not. Um, Do you ever build any audio projects? And if you have, where can we see those? 
No. Um, I have, uh, I mentioned the tube amp thing uh, earlier. Uh, and when I did that one, that one actually got up on Hackaday way back. Um, but as far, I think, I think there's even still a tutorial uh, on the SparkFun website uh, about that one. Oh, there's that too. Yeah, we did this. We did the According to Pete video that's got like the guitar thing where uh, uh, I used uh, surface transducers as pickups. So could you cut me a couple of jumpers about that long? Sure, just solid, solid, solid shielded. Yeah. And that video's out there, but you gotta go hunt for it. Yellow. In our video Perfect. section. Go see our video section. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to focus a little bit just because I know that we're kind of far into this and I've screwed up at least one thing. And I don't know where these guys are at. Uh, history. I'm, I'm in sort of a similar boat. I, I got all turned around so, my first. <laughs> we, we may be doing this until 8 o'clock tonight. Sorry, Is guys. That good? Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Do you? The SparkFun sound detector in any projects for your home use? For my home use? No, not really. I think my favorite my favorite application of the sound detector was the singing unicorn that Nick Pula built. Mmm. Unicorns. There's a, there's a wonderful video of that, and you get to hear Nick's unicorn voice. <laughs> Can I hear an impre impression of Nick's unicorn voice? <laughs> not for me. No. <laughs> Nick, get over here. I want to hear it. <laughs> Put a link on it. How many of these do you need? Um, I just needed the two. Okay. Well. Another audience question. Uh, do you guys have any favorite components? And if so, why? Like any components? Resistors. Why? Because they come in a wide variety of values and they all cost the same and don't get any bigger. Interesting. I like inductors. Cause, Why? Because magnetism is freaking magic, man. And transformers, because transformers. they're sound Transformers. Right? Yeah. I never really thought about that before. I'm going to go with LEDs. I like LEDs. They light up. Everybody likes LEDs. Everyone likes LEDs. That are FPGAs, but I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Did you make Which this kind not everybody's favorite. Marshall, could you make uh, a couple okay. more of those little deals? Is yellow okay for you? Um, do a different color. <laughs> I've already made the yellow ones. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what'd you say, green? Sure. Well, yeah, were you feeding me yellow because I said that wasn't my favorite color? Almost mm, certainly. Maybe. That's what I would have done. And then maybe I'll talk about the test equipment. Yeah, yes. Do you only need two of these? Yeah. I was going to look up that voltage. Are you sure it's 10 millivolts? It's in the book in your lap. There's a little table right there. That in the Five. audio radio handbook that we've got, they can actually characterize a number of cartridges for their, their nominal output voltages. And they list uh, a few. They've got 5 millivolts, 8 yeah, millivolts, 3.5 millivolts, um, and a couple more fives. So, I'm going to set up a test signal a little early. I'm going to take that. Uh, so what I've got over here, I don't know which one, I've got a, an audio generator that can produce various frequencies. Um, and I have a, an oscilloscope that I can see those, those signals on. Um, so first, let's set it up to some frequency. How about a kilohertz? Is that right? That's a good place to start. And it's worth mentioning, I'm saying that's a good place to start because the Raya preamp, that, that long slopey curve is actually specified in terms relative to the one kilohertz measurement. <clears throat> and also worth mentioning, in that table that Marshall was just looking at, telling us five millivolts, 
that for real world signals, five millivolts is tiny, 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 and pretty hard to deal with, pretty hard to take any distance. So we really want to bump that up to something bigger before we try to do anything with it. Again, a function of the preamp that it, it applies a gain of 40 decibels and gives us, I don't know, more or less, what was it, a, a volt peak to peak? Up. On the output of the preamp. It's really fuzzy. That's really fuzzy. Nice. No, that's it's right, it needs to be loaded. Is that sh that's shorting to my bench? It might not matter. And we've got a bunch of... Can you hear that at all, Mike? Yeah. Yes. Is it fuzzy? The audience uh, says beep. That's it. <laughs> Sounds about a kilohertz. Yeah. The eagle has landed. Um, do you remember if we tested? I think we tested a little bit higher than five. We were at about ten, but we were having trouble. That's about where we are right now, too. I'm gonna unplug that feed for a second. See if it cleans up. Oh yeah, that looks a lot better. So that's no good. Uh, Mike, can you turn the audio on the generator on for a minute? I'm gonna sweep it around just to show what it sounds like. And I can actually hear it like coming out of the thing too. Yeah, Something's moving to around. Uh, <laughs> along with the scraping knob. Sounds glorious. Where is it? Right there. All right, so later we'll be able to apply this test signal, measure it on the input, and measure it on the output, and then calculate the decibel gain at that frequency. Um, then by taking a few samples along our frequency range, we can figure out if we're roughly in that curve that we've intended or not. And so, we need one more resistor to solder in and we can show a little bit of a progress report again. So stupid, I've got a board voice, a board vice right here, but I'm not. No, no. <laughs> it's too far away. I just mm, can't uh, do it. I can hold it for you. No, get out of here, you. Oh, man. It's really low on the, it's 20 millivolts per division. Um, and, oh, let's take a picture of it. This is actually kind of interesting. Um, so, in the old days, they actually put cameras up against the scopes, and that's how they recorded them. <laughs> in the old building, we actually had one of those cameras. Oh, the hood? Yeah. yeah, and the it, camera it, it mounted like a ray gun. It was a, it um, a Polaroid land camera with a, a crazy attachment that, that nested right on the front of the scope. So this has got about 20 feet of wire as well as being the five millivolts target signal. So if you take off the 20 feet of wire, um, that looks I great. don't think we can get much cleaner than that. Um, also this has vacuum tubes in it, this uh, signal generator. So, Oops, so it's not the most here. accurate thing. Oh, yeah, it's pretty. I'll just leave it out for now. If you want more beepings, we can arrange that. And so just a quick status update. If you look at the schematic that we're building, the feedback network around the op amp has two resistors and two caps that sort of make a figure eight. right there. And so I just built the feedback networks for the two channels right there. You can, you can see that there's a row of the breadboard that the two resistors in the middle of the two caps all meet. 
which would be that center point of that feedback network. Now is a good time I want to note that these are the poles and zeros, and you need something. I need the meter. Um, in the feedback network, these two uh, active elements, uh, C4 and C5, account for the poles. Um, and the active element down here, C2, accounts for the zero in the system. So if you have, if you've studied op amps, so you don't see, if you don't have any uh, inductors or capacitors in your, uh, in your circuit, then you're going to have a, a just a straight gain type equation. Um, once you start introducing these active components, uh, is when you start to get it, to get the uh, the, the knee and pole um, frequency response, and that's how you build the filters by carefully calculating and picking those values. I'm not okay, man. Let's take a look. Uh, just over the years, I've developed so many different ways of like keeping a component <laughs> in while I. Oh, it's looking good. Very tenuously try to solder it. But, yeah. Tinning wires with one hand. Huh? What are some of those methods? Uh, well, for example, holding the PCB with one finger while something sits very precariously in a socket. Uh, so sitting Indian style with it clamped between your feet? Right. <laughs> I just, like, just hold still for a sec so I can tack it. There. And then you push it in. You're gonna need a power cable? Uh, ultimately. I'm gonna make you one. Could you make me yeah, a couple thanks, more brother. of those little jumpers of a different color still? Can I have mine yellow, please? Did Just you both. Th I want ground, yellow, and uh, I'm gonna twist them, though. I want yellow. Okay. So that you can't tell. I got a meter. Check it out, man. I'm a professional. No, they're red and black. Sorry. No. I already had them pulled out of the thing. I don't Whatever, want to spoon back up. Whatever. Another audience question. How do you make a Bluetooth device into NFC Bluetooth? I don't have an answer for that. I don't How either. do you make a Bluetooth device into a, an NFC Bluetooth? Is NFC even Bluetooth? I mean, it's <laughs> an entirely different. Uh, I, d I don't understand the question. Entirely different, yeah. Ask us easy questions. What's up? There's another audience question if you'd like to try that one. <laughs> Is this going to make me sorry? Go for it. Why Have not? you tried retro BSD with the, U uh, the USB Bitwhacker 32? I haven't. I don't think I've ever used a Bitwhacker. I don't think I've ever used a Bitwhacker. I'm sorry. I'm always talking to Tony because she's the one asking the questions. Tony, do you stand by the camera so it's an obvious thing? No, you didn't. No, of course not. Um, oh, oh, you know what? Pills. You know what the kit doesn't have is heat sink compound. No, it really ought to. Um, let's see. This reminds me of on the bench. Or Which bench? Your bench? Oh, over there. One. Do you know where? Yeah. Okay. I think so. I'll trust you, brother. Maybe Casey's here. Right, without heat sink compound, this is sort of just because it looks nice, which is dumb. Where could one find heat sink compound, Pete? Uh, at the heat sink compound store. Um, in, the, pad? in the PC modding aisle of the electronic <laughs> shop. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, I think we sell some. Don't we sell heat sink compound? I think we I used think we to. Do. I don't know if we yeah. sell it. It's one of those things that I think, like, uh, you know, shipping companies get wind of it and they figure, oh, that's something different we need to charge you extra money for because it's somehow dangerous. Or maybe not, I don't know. Did you find it? Did you find still at home, Is that good? PRT 09599. Ah, thank you, ma'am. So, okay, in lieu of actual heat sink compound, I've got uh, the uh, double stick A. Yeah, oh, even the scissors, thank you. And this will Ooh, that's much better. Thank you, dude. That's Mike. He rocks. Slightly more than Marshall at this oh. point. 
I like the silk pad. <laughs> Doesn't get all over your fingers. Yeah, I. Uh, uh, I was doing um, a lighting fixture at home, and uh, I was putting um, a bridge rectifier on a heat sink, and I'm like, oh, just a little dab, and it's just everywhere. It's on my clothes. It's in my hair. Just one of those things. Do, 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 do. Wow, all right, the audience is throwing questions at us now. Throwing. What sort of impedance is connected up to the phono in the schematic since my DIY RIAA filter has some shattering issues? The questions come. We all just look at each other. Like, Stop working. <laughs> uh, what? Uh, I'm not sure what chattering is meaning. Um, can, you, can we comment back? I guess You're we're, we're on live. Camera, brother. You can say whatever you want. Well, <laughs> can, can you describe the the chattering a little bit more? Is it a, like a an amplitude change or a? Um, is it, does it sound like a distortion? There's a delay, so give it a minute. Uh, it's a sound like my son going, phone, Dad, phone Dad, 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 <laughs> Dad, Dad, let me tell you about uh, Minecraft. Another question, do you have any tips on soldering temperature? That's a good question. Uh, 750? <laughs> Yeah, mine says, it, yeah, I'm a little over 750, maybe 760, 400 plus on the Celsius. But you usually don't run 750 in your office. Uh-oh. I because, thought I've seen it a little closer Because that one's converted in Celsius. Oh, okay, that's the only reason. <laughs> um, sometimes I'll turn mine down to about 550 to 600. Uh, and if you do that, you're kind of capable of doing more of a weld type action where you can kind of stack the solder up and like flow it from one location to another, um, if that makes any sense. Or if you've got some, no. some of this uh, proto board and you want to bridge a whole bunch of things together, turn your soldering iron down and it doesn't flow so much. Um, but otherwise, I kind of leave it on 750. If it's really big parts, I'll kick it up to 850. All right. Ground planes are particularly bad they act like heat sinks and take all your heat away. So another audience question, wouldn't the figure eight feedback loop in your circuit be the same as a single pole at the equivalent capacitance and resistance? Ooh. They're hardballing you. They are hardballing. <laughs> I think somebody, uh, somebody knows what they're talking about out there. <laughs> <laughs> and they're trying to expose us as people who don't know what they're talking about. I don't think so because of the two loops. If you took off the center bridge of the figure eight, it would act like a single capacitor and single resistor. I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> well, if we had the, the spice sim in front of us, because each of those give us a different knee on the body plot. Right. And I, I've seen it with where all the poles and zeros are, so it definitely has three. And if you equated everything down to a couple of components, it would only have two. So not a very good answer, but it, w it, it w wouldn't quite be the same. Another question. How would you recommend shielding microcontrollers such as ADR, PIC, and others from the high voltage noise lake from the spark from a spark plug? Hmm. Caps and inductors. Well, if it, is it coming through the air? Is it coming through um, the ground? You can put a common mode choke on your power and ground signals uh, to remove perpetrations on, on the power system. So if you're in a car and you've plugged into the 12 volt system and you're hearing noise on that, or if you had a scope and connected it to your um, 
your car power system and see a lot of noise on it, that can be filtered out by, by building line filters um, or pulling them out of coffee machines or something. If it's coming through the air, you'd probably want to put a can on it and then ground the can. Um, what about a metal shield? Around, around, yeah, yeah the can well, is a metal yeah, that's shield. that's what he means by can. Okay. Um, but don't use it as a, as a D ground, use it as a, a chassis ground and connect it somewhere else. Um, so you'd make your whole circuit and then put it into something that's not rigidly grounded to your signal ground. Um, because you want it to absorb all the waves and EMI and stuff um, and not let that get into, in, into your circuit. Hey, you guys. Mm -hmm. I'm nearing completion. Ooh, let's test some stuff. So I'd like to say I'm nearing completion, but I have extra parts. <laughs> you don't need those. So what will the interface from me to you be? Just loose wire? Yeah. You said you have screw terminals? Yeah. Okay. Incidentally, I hate screw terminals. Why'd you put them on the kit, Pete? Because everybody else seems to like screw terminals. Fine. Why Can't do you hate them? Stand them. Um, because uh, the ones that we've got, I don't like them because they're really, oh, and these are even better. These are flathead. Okay. Uh, I don't like them because it's really hard to find um, a, a screwdriver that's, that's small enough to fit. Um, and I've got a couple. I brought this Phillips because it fits the ones that I have at home. Looks like we've changed screw terminal suppliers or something of that nature because those are flat. That you might got fit. You got it. Okay. I got a smaller yeah, one too. Actually, that looks pretty good. Uh, yep, that'll do. Cool. I'll take it. Here you want to, when you're ready. Not yet. You're freaking me out. All man. right. <laughs> and like magic. The toolkit appears. <laughs> well, I didn't want the toolkit. We need a ground and two signal wires. And then two more for to, to tie to hand. Yes. Somebody said that's what goes over his And I'm just signals. counting components to make sure I'm reasonably in the ballpark. <laughs> <laughs> Another remember audience I... question from our very own Rob Cowan. Uh -oh. What's a phonograph? Is it like an iPod? For you, yes. <laughs> it's a very big iPod. Good answer, guys. <laughs> the, the call is coming from within the building. Mm. <laughs> I think it's fairly similar. In a, in a way, I mean, if you take this audio signal that's varying, and you, instead of encoding it into a depth into the, the, the media, you turn it into a digital number and store it into a piece of memory, same well, and, thing. And, and the fact that they are both encoded and decoded, mm -hmm. there, there are equivalent processes granted in different realms, analog versus digital. But MP3 encoding, or what do they call it? The Apple, Apple magic encoding? Excuse me. Could could be seen as similar to the emphasis the emphasis curves. Well, I guess the only the difference is that one of them is just the the memory part, and the other one has the player with it. Well, I guess the phonograph. The phonograph one, doesn't have the media. One of them is in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> And one of them holds hours and hours and hours worth of songs. The other one melts in your car. <laughs> Just long enough? Sure. Sweet. Well, you guys are finishing that up. Uh, would you mind recommending any resources on circuit examples and explanations of them for the less experienced electronics person? Depends on which circuits you want examples audio circuits? of. Any circuits. Your favorite circuit. 
Uh, uh, I will usually take the circuit of interest, put it into Google, and see what I come up with. I will usually. <laughs> I'm just going to keep doing the, this. The Forest Mims books. Forest Mims mm. are good, yeah. Forest yeah. Mims. And, uh, and all stuff that you can build with about a dollar's components and a 9 volt battery. <laughs> Um, the Forest Mims, do you have one in your office I can grab? Yeah, there's, there's a pile grab some. They're cool. There's a pile of them. The National Semiconductor Audio Radio Handbook. In fact, any old National Semiconductor Handbook, data sheet, app note, all of that stuff is gold for circuit designers. High praise indeed. Um, or this book, the Douglas Self Small Signal Audio Design book. Um, great um, pro audio sorts of stuff. If you're not into pro audio, you can probably ignore it, but if you're into pro audio, all of the secrets are in here. This, this guy really knows what he's talking about. He was a designer at um, Soundcraft, where they made mixers. Um, if, if you do a patent search for him, you can turn up some pretty interesting patented stuff that he did. Not that we're into patents around here. So what did you and cut from? I grabbed the Force. Oh the, yes, the Force Mims book. Um, he's really good about talking about how the things work. And this is actually where I started. Was one of these from Radio Shack. Um, they got all the happy little components there, happy little electrons and stuff. Um, but I was pretty young, and it made a lot of sense to me. Uh, so if you can get get your hands on one of these these types, uh, everything he does is in this hand drawn kind of a style. Um, and they, they usually put a bunch of circuits in there that are pretty simple that you get that you can uh, you just follow along and put together and see what happens. Um, another place to start is with uh, if you can get a kit of components that has some some basic stuff like a, a I don't I don't know if they're too common anymore. Um, our SIK is a good example. It's got all the the basic type of here. How do you how do you make an LED turn on and how how do you um, what does a tr transistor really do? I'm getting some of my junk out of the way so we can... Okay. Do you guys have any opinions on the ARRL handbook? They're impossible to read. <laughs> uh, but they got a lot of good information. One. I think it's from like 1967 or something. But I've got one. I think I've got at least one as well. I had the 82. It's one of those things you acquire, right? You'll meet an old ham dude who you're like, hey, you gotta check out his book. And you get like two or three of them in the course of years. Mike's laughing because he relates. That old guy. <laughs> How about Elliot Sound Projects? Yeah. Yeah, there's some good stuff there. In fact, I was, I was consulting that as I was researching preamp designs. Um, another thing, it kind of related, in the GitHub, there's also a, an example of just a single pole filter. Um, and if you go to the LT Spice and download their free tool, uh, you can load that up and hit the simulate button, and it'll show you the frequency response. Um, and then you can play around with the components and just kind of see yeah, how the yeah, thing Spice works. is like a, an endless toolbox of components. But even before you, you've gone and purchased the parts, you can play around with them, figure out what they're doing, hopefully to inform you when you move to a physical design, give you a little better foundation as to how things work. What are you right, so doing there, Pete? I'm hooking up my speakers. Should I look at, I'm hooking up my speakers. How? How? With a screwdriver and some hoar. Are, are you that bold? You're not going to test it before you hook them up? I checked it with the meter. It's not a dead short. Let's roll. Here's the power when you're ready. Yeah, I'm almost ready. All right, so I got one end's tinned, and the other one's ready to solder. Great, thank you. I keep going for this, this dry sponge rather than the Brillo pad. Do, 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 do. 
That's my uh, public domain humming. Oop. Okay. That was almost bad. Can you hold up the Forest Mims book again? Sure. And also for anyone listening, we sell those on the website in our book section. <laughs> All right, this is volume four. I didn't, what other ones do you have in your office there? I think there's four volumes total. All right, that's why I, I took the right one, most one. Okay. Um, and I'll show it from the beginning too. The covers always have some uh, basic schematic symbols in them. Um, and he'll go into det detail about how there's alternating current. RMS is a good lesson. I mean, this, this is all, if you take a, engineering degree, this is all the stuff they're going to teach you. Here's the hex and decimal conversions. And these are a lot, a lot better than the old Radio Shack ones because they're smaller. The other ones were kind of big. Wire sizes? Another question from the audience. What is that Texas instrument thing on the <laughs> table? Is it just a calculator? Oh, it's this? Just a calculator. It's like his freaking This one's pretty tricorder. funny. Um, this is a TI-81, essentially, with a keyboard. And then it sold for like $1,000 or something. Um, and so it didn't, I, somebody gave it to me because they were like, oh, I'm going to throw this away. I'm like, no, give that to me. <laughs> um, but it really works just like the 81, TI-89, 89. 89. It's the HP-91 I had too. Uh, the TI-89, this is the same firmware, and actually I'm going to turn it on. It looks the same. So if you're familiar with that calculator, it's got the same menu systems and all the functions are the same. I'm sure it's a little bit faster, but it's really just a, a regular calculator. Uh, are my wires plugged in anything yet? Okay, cool. Nope. Just set. Um, can you set the supply to like 13 volts and limit it at about 150 milliamps? Sure. And tick me off of it before you do that. Uh, I'll just use uh, two yeah. different supplies. You know, ooh, fancy. Super fancy. I have hooked plus and minus to the correct terminals. That's a good sign. Could you repeat the name of the book for the pro audio stuff or audio circuits? Yeah, one second. Focus. There are two of them that I've got here. I've got the National Semiconductor Audio Radio Handbook. And I've got Douglas Self's Small Signal Audio Design. And Douglas Self also does a couple of other books. There's a Power Amp book. He's also got a really good website if you search for him. Lots of schematics, lots of like noise comparison of op amps was one of the things that he did. Mm. Uh, excuse me. I was like yawning with a mouthful of water. All right, brother. All right, hold on. So I'm going to short your the power supply out and turn it up until it's got 150 milliamps. Uh, that's more. Uh, you don't that's want 1.5. <laughs> that's like an amp. There you go. I look good? Yeah, that'll be good. Okay. This is just to make sure that I haven't done something exceptionally it's stupid. Like, it should be all right. Do you want to monitor on current or voltage? Um, current, current. Okay. The voltage should stay the same. The current, I expect to change. All right, am I plugged in? Nope. Plug me in, baby. You probably made your wires too short. Can you hold it while I drag? I can. Teamwork at its finest, folks. Ready? Yeah. <gasps> 30 milliamps. So far, so good. All right, good. don't do nothing. Okay, so the standby LED is on when it's on standby. <laughs> Who knew? Um, I'm just checking to make sure that I'm not burning anything. I'm drawing 30 milliamps. Uh, uh, like I said before I started this, um, before you hook up power to any circuit that you built, uh, 
You take one of these and you make sure that your power and ground are not shorted. Uh, I also checked to make sure that there wasn't any short between power and the speaker inputs, both plus and minus, and also the speaker outputs to make sure that those look okay. Um, after that, turn all the levels down all the way, make sure the standby switch is on so it's not going to be feeding the speakers right away. Tell my cohort to limit the supply to 150 milliamps because I know that won't burn anything on this board. Although it might have made sir, for some very entertaining uh, YouTube. Um, but at this point, I think I'm good. So now, I'm just going to throw the standby switch and see, I think it'll come up to about 90 milliamps with no input. Eh, 100, 110, so we're good. Uh, nothing wiggy is happening at the speaker. Yeah, I think we're good. I'm ready for a signal. Do you, or do you want to try it with a regular, like, I don't have a signal. I guess we can plug it into the signal generator. I don't care, whatever. I thought you wanted, what's that turntable over there? What's that? Uh, well, what we need the middle. Uh, that's right, <laughs> that's right. There was a point to this. You want to plug this signal into it? And then we can actuate it with the Yeah, but you're going to need the a couple of jumpers. I see this. So, uh, yeah. Jumper maker is my name. We're not allowed to talk about the time elapsed. Are we losing our audience? I don't, I, I mean, I care. Yeah. I care, but honestly, remaining. this is taking a long time, not because we suck at what we do, which we may, but that's beside the point. Uh, it's more because we like doing what we're doing. We like talking about it, we like building stuff, and this is cool. As long as you're hanging out with us, I'm cool with it. We have literally dozens of viewers. Yay, dozens! You want those ends? That's fine. Solid, no that's not solid, it's just... I have another question that came in. What is the craziest project idea that you've actually tried? Uh... <laughs> Might be one of Nate's. <laughs> Sorry, man. Uh, I don't really know, honestly. Do you mean? Oh, are, 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 uh, do you mean like as a company, as SparkFun, or as um, just something that we're building on our own? Like this can't possibly work. Either. Either. Make um, good TV. Come on. I don't know. I don't know. Hang on a sec. We're in the middle of testing here. Go for it. Have I got a signal? You've got a signal. Right. Not a very big signal. That's fine. Everything's turned down. That's, uh, and I am on the right. Oh, I something. can give you more amplitude, too. Yeah, I hear give, me, it. give me more amplitude. We got a signal. Oh, Who's that? Before you go jacking with that. That was your fault. Oh, we, we, got, we exceeded our 150. Oh, so it's clipping. Okay, you can, yeah, open that up. That's probably good. You know what I'm saying? All right. All right, let me try the uh, other channel now. So while you're testing, do you have a preferred method of locating a short in a circuit? Not that um. you have any shorts. <laughs> Preferred, preferred method. method. Turn, turn up the current limit until it smokes. <laughs> I was going to say, if you have access to a FLIR, you can see the oh, trace that's on. getting hot. I think we, we sell we the sell FLIR those. modules. Yeah. I know, but They are expensive, though. I trust the finger method. Put your finger that's on it see if it's hot. When you say ow. Um, the other preferred method is to design links in your circuit so that you Am can... Separate it out and turn off parts of it to see if the current drops after. Uh... Oh, that's why I couldn't hear it. Quit doing that. <laughs> okay, so I got signal on both of these. I'm good. Cool. So now all we need is uh, his you man. Pressure's on. It's pretty close, I think. I'm getting. Uh... Inputs and outputs wired. Oh, maybe I should start setting up the turntable. Set up the turntable. That sounds cool. I'm gonna do the improper thing and set it up on the speaker. <laughs> is that improper? I guess it's improper. Feedback. It's like it's like feedback. 
It's a lot like feet. Now we put it on the desk here. Who's going circles? I really did get the easy gig here. I didn't have to talk very much. I just had to build a kit. I'm liking it. I'll put it up there. Now you got to run the turntable. Oh my! Uh, oh gee! Ah. What I meant to say was, oh gee! I I I. All right, switch to phono out. Okay. Oh. Hey, Marshall, since you're the newest engineer, here's a pop quiz for you. What does RTFM stand for? Uh, Watch your mouth. Read the friggin' manual. <laughs> <laughs> that was so not. Which is tough, even if you're experienced, you find yourself, oh, well, I should have read it. It was right there all along. I'm still partial to real-time fun machine. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna go straight for that. For our listening pleasure. We're not gonna go for... You listen to Sparkle? The, the death metal? The, the Gordon metal? We'll finish with Gordon. Okay, good. Did we get the, the Gordon? Oh, do you have one? Oh, I thought, that was, I thought that was that one. Is What's it? that? No, that's Plankton. Plankton? Plankton. Plankton. Old, old friends of mine. Yeah. Music that we can use That'll online do. because I know I know it's not licensed. <laughs> <laughs> Open source music. Do you know of open source music sources? Uh, Podsafemusic.com. I did not. I did not. Who has its own library? Oh. YouTube, for those who didn't hear Mike. YouTube, yeah, because I didn't say YouTube. Sorry. So, okay, we're setting up another supply. Byron is furiously soldering because he's a furious individual. Feel the fury. What's your, yes you do. What is your ETA, sir? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Ooh. I only have to make stuff up for 30 seconds. That's pretty cool. Uh, what do you think, 50 million? Knock knock jokes? Ooh, I can't tell that joke. Um. Okay, Marshall, how are we gonna test this? I'm gonna give it 100 milliamps, see what happens. Do you, do you want the meter? Do you have a meter? Oh, so you just make sure it's not shorted and plug it in. What do you expect it to draw? 10 milliamps? All right. So if it's not shorted, limit the supply to like 50 milliamp, plug it in. Why is it shorted? Crap. What's on your, what is, what is this, what's this, show me the schematic. What is it, what should it be? There's a 10 mic cap between power and ground. And no chance you're just charging up the cap. It's too slow. That's point four. There you go. I plugged them in like that so I wouldn't uh, <laughs> connect them to power. That was your 60k. That's power. That sounds good. All right. Okay. So, what have you got for voltage there? Um, I'm not plugged in. I've got 13 volts. Okay. Do you want power? Go for yeah, it. Hit, hit me with 13. You are limited, right? Yep, 100 milliamps. 12.95, okay. And where are we with current limit? 100 milliamps. Not even touching it. Right. Okay. So our reference voltage is at 6.4. So far so good. good. Our outputs are at zero. Bear with us. 
and and also zero. We're discharging a cap, so zero. Okay. Why is that there? <laughs> Why is that there? The audience says that when you guys mess up, they learn the most, so don't worry. It's gonna burn! If you're lucky. So we may have one working channel here, I'm guessing. Well, you know it's not gonna fry. Just run some audio through. I mean, you're, you're powered now. Throw a signal through it and let's just see what it, goes, what it yeah. does. Well, these are our input signals. Those are our output signals. Okay. So do we wanna put the scope channel scope to channel the signals? On it? Sure, we see how they're working and then we plug them in. Yeah. And perhaps find where things are getting lost part way through. Everybody loves that sound. Can you put signal in here? Um, isn't that the output? That's the That's input. input. <laughs> no. I've got this. That'll work. Yes. I think we uh, messed up our polarities and something. Okay, now I need these. Oh, okay, probably be all right. Here you go. Do we need more clip leads? Um, I don't know. Because I'm guess. I mean, as soon as you see signal through it, we can just connect it up and then declare victory. We tested the prototype and checked out all the frequencies, and it, it was about right. Um, I don't think we want to go through that exercise I doubt right now. Though. Is the blue your output? The, the blue is my pro. Oh, got it. So okay. let's see. There's the input node. Why don't I see anything? Because it's wiggy. These are 10x probes. Well, that explains something because I didn't change it when I plugged this in. Uh, so one of our channels is still configured to be 10x, even though, and that's probably explaining why where all the noise it, came from is too. It 10x. <laughs> so basically, we're just gonna like <laughs> struggle with engineering. Uh, this is literally how it goes. Right. I mean, there's generally even less commentary and much more complaining and griping. Oops. If I touch, touch the probe, I see. There's 20 millivolts. Okay. So now we need more amplitude. There's the problem. Ah. There we go. That's probably why it was so fuzzy. Does it make it into the right. And what's our frequency? About a K, 1300. See if that kills it this time. Okay, we see it at the input. You're at a K, you say? Mm -hmm. And of course, we're. You're DC coupled. We're DC coupled. There you go. Ta da! So then, if I jump to the output. We are gained. There we go, and it's right. huge. So we see some phase shift, that the, the peaks of the two relative to each other are a little bit off. You say you're at 1K, Marshall? Yeah. So if I sweep downwards, Down we see the, the, the blue signal is... Oh. oh, that was amusing. That's the, uh, the, the tube inside stabilizing. Huh. 
what, what's our frequency here? 100. 100 hertz. So we see that 100 is much larger relative. And as we sweep up, it gets yeah. smaller. So the yellow we, trace stays We the think same. we've got the right character there. Should we give a quick troubleshoot to the other channel, or should we just jump in to... Do it. Just rock. Jump in. Come just on. jump in. It's okay. not going to burn. You know, you know it's not going to burn. If it doesn't burn, hook everything up. Make it burn. Okay, here we go. Um, I need a couple more leads for my other channel. Oh, what are these? Uh, Inputs? That is the left channel input, yes. Okay, Yellow we've got a double brown. lead scenario. This is the input. This is the one that's working. Okay. So plug the turntable in there. Well, this is, no, we need to go, yeah, that's right. I, blah, blah, blah. And then plug these into Pete. Which while ones? you guys are hooking everything up, White. another audience question, what level of education do you all have? Or what did you study at school? Post-secondary, um, wait, what am I, what is this? Uh, input. This is, so this is output from that. Mm -hmm. um, I've got, uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. hang on, I gotta think. Is green so, ground? You, you think, I'll talk. Okay, you talk. So I've got a bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Wyoming. Um, had most of a double E degree as well, but the the cosine degree was a little more attainable, and so that's the one that got finished. And I've got a bachelor's in electrical engineering from the University of Idaho. Um, I started off, I did some music for a while, and I tried computer science before I finally settled on electrical engineering. Back to you. I have no education. Um, I. Uh, I've had an associate's degree from Northwestern Electronics Institute in New Brighton, Minnesota. Woo! Um, that was uh, a few years ago. Uh, and then I got older and decided I would become an electrical yeah. engineer. And then I went to CU Boulder, uh, where I graduated at the ripe old age of 37. And that's where I met Nate. And so I've got a bachelor's in E and that tech thing. That's pretty cool. Uh, all right, I got, uh, I'm in, uh, you d didn't verify, uh, is white signal? White is signal. Green, Green is ground. ground. All right, I'm plugged into the uh, right channel. Have I got a signal? Um, uh, we were gonna have a signal from Play our... me some music, DJ. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. What works. album are you playing currently? The uh... stereo systems test record. <laughs> <laughs> See that also one? public domain. Uh, how to do it? There we go. Do, 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 do. That's okay. A. That is right. Are we waiting for the automation? It's fighting me. It, it doesn't. This is Joe's turn. There we go. Oh my God! It's gonna be loud. You have volume. Is it kilohertz? That's really awful. Interesting. Beautiful popping noise. All right, uh, can we get a uh, left channel as well? I don't know if it's working or not. How are you gonna find out? Plug it in. It is plugged in. Is it? I think we want 5A. I got nothing coming in on the, uh, oh wait a minute. No, these are my, those are my oh, leads to so my other channel. You need so all this right, one. I'm gonna I'm gonna stand this by. I'm What's try that? To the track. That's the other signal. Is that that's oh uh, ground is common obviously. Yeah. Okay. Hang on a sec. Can we see? And just make sure I don't do anything. So Iron, do you mind explaining stupid. what a test record is? So this is, this is a record that they put a bunch of test signals on. I don't know, ideally this would be like a scientific instrument where all of the things printed on it would okay. be at a known reference level. This one isn't necessarily a good one. I don't know if it's <laughs> scientific grade or not. Have you got both channels? Do you? you I don't know. I can hear it. Can you turn it up a little bit? Do you hear that popping? Yeah. <laughs> that's surface noise. Yeah. I know, but it's still, that's loud. If I turn it up more, it's going to be even louder popping. 
Well, this is, this is the, uh, this one goes through a bunch of frequencies, 50, 100, 200, 400, 700, um, all the way up to 10K. Hang on. So if yeah, it sounds is... even to us, we've succeeded. And if it doesn't sound even to us, it could be that they weren't printed evenly when they made the record. <laughs> All right, let's let's have music. Let's have some death metal. Let's have what do we got? Blowed. What? Blowed. 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 Yeah. Blowed. Do we have the, we have the blowed jazz here? This one. Right. Blowed. Yes, that one. Plug her in. So, Tony, explain the background here. So, uh, for those of you playing the home game, oh the blowed record was a Kickstarter. Uh, from a few years ago when we did Free Day, and whoa, good catch, Marshall. Don't touch the face. I'm gonna give this to you. Uh, <laughs> but basically, it's our up. IT wizards um, did some magic, and they were basically logging the Sparkle data or something like that. And we, we should mention that Sparkle is sort of the back end of the website. Right, yes, the back yes. end of the website. And so they logged all the, the website calls and stuff for Free Day, and then somehow translated that into jazz music. I think they actually used Blowed, which is a thing online. There's a whole blog post about it somewhere back in the SparkFun blog history, so. But basically this is me. Ooh. Is computer generated? It's computer generated from website visitors. Have we got both a left and a right? I don't think so. They just have that side. Really? Yeah. I don't know which side. No, is the, which the one channel of the preamp isn't there yet. Oh. Okay. But it sounds about like what it did when we listened to it uh, a couple of weeks ago. So are we attempting to make the other channel work, or are we going to call this a victory? You, you are our illustrious leader. You get to make the executive decision. We've been doing this for a while. What does the audience say? Audience, do you want to put us through that pain? Anybody? No. Do you have it? They, they, they say no. <laughs> <laughs> then we hereby declare victory on the uh, Rhea Priam. Put the death metal on? Yeah. <laughs> Always. Which I don't know what it is. That, that's more indie rock than death metal. Okay. <laughs> Finishing that up, do you guys have any other closing thoughts or remarks for the audience? Words of wisdom? Uh, nuggets of knowledge? It's not I open. I think I shared all my nuggets when I was building and destroying this circuit. Um, so stay in school. Of, a nugget of knowledge from pressing your own record, as my friends did. You can save a couple of bucks per, per piece if you get a daisy seal a meal. And then you can do your own shrink wrap job in your kitchen. Uh. <laughs> Which I'm undoing here. Um, other nuggets is that it's, we both made the same error that we've made before when trying to get the, the, the input to the, the op amp coupled in at half, half rail. Um, how did we solve that? I think we just had to stop and think about it. <laughs> Stopping and thinking. Stopping and yeah, thought st about stopping it. Stopping and thinking was not exactly the order of business today. Not today. <laughs> but and then we put it into LT Spice and simulated to ensure that we were that it was what we thought was going to happen. Um, Yay, record. This is the first time ever being played. This is a 45. Hit that 45 button there for me. <laughs> no way! <laughs> Touch it. That's awesome. Are you kidding me? Uh, yeah, I might. I can prefer it in low. <laughs> All right. So at that.
that. I suppose we ought to call it. Gentlemen, thank, thank you. you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Sir. Sir. For all y'all who stood with us and uh, tolerated all the shenanigans and all this stuff, uh, thanks for tuning in. And, and for uh, all the thoughtful questions and comments. Yeah, that kept us going. That was pretty cool. Um, any other closers that we require for this thing? All right, well, we're going to call it. Goodbye. Thanks. It is. Just slow it down. Slow down the Indian music.